This video is about one of the simplest sounding puzzles in mathematics, a problem about prime numbers that even a 10 year old can understand, and yet it's resisted solution for more than a century. It's a problem that young mathematicians are warned not to waste their time on, but this problem has led to the development of some of the most sophisticated mathematics of the last 100 years. It also played a key role in James Maynard winning the Fields Medal in 2022. But to see where it all began, we have to go back in time. The year is 1912 in Cambridge, England. A prominent German professor named Edmund Landau stands before the audience and announces four open problems that he thinks are unattackable. This video is the story of the second one, the twin prime conjecture. So what is a twin prime? Let's list out the first few prime numbers. Every so often, you'll spot two prime numbers that are exactly two apart, three and five, five and seven, 11 and 13, and so on. These pairs are called twin primes. And here's the big mystery. Do these pairs continue on forever? Or will we eventually find the last one? The twin prime conjecture says, there are infinitely many twin primes. If we look at the first 100 positive integers, here are the primes highlighted. Now here are the twin primes highlighted. Notice that not every prime is a twin prime. In the first 1000 positive integers, here are the twin primes highlighted. No matter how far we look, these twin primes seem to keep popping up, even though they don't seem to be very common. So we can find twin primes, all right, but that's not enough. We need to show that we'll never stop finding them. Now, if there's one thing I wanna make very clear, it's this. Prime numbers are really, really complicated. They're distributed very chaotically, but there's one rule of thumb that's helpful to keep in mind. Imagine a water sprinkler that's infinitely high. It sprays water far and wide and the droplets land on the ground. Now, if you're standing really close to the sprinkler, then there are lots of droplets on the ground. But if you're farther away, there are much fewer droplets. This is a good analogy for how the primes are spaced out. Imagine that each droplet represents a prime. When you start off in the number line, there are lots of primes. But as you go out, there are much fewer primes. The relative density of, of primes in the whole integers becomes smaller and smaller the further you go towards infinity. We need to quantify this. Here's how we can do that. Suppose you pick a number, say n equals 100, and you pick a positive integer less than n at random. What's the probability that you choose a prime number? A brute force search shows that there are 25 primes less than 100. So the probability of choosing a prime is 25%. Okay, so 100 was a whimsical choice. Let's say we pick a different number, say n equals 1000. A count shows that there are 168 primes less than 1000. So the probability of choosing a prime is 16.8%. Let's plot this below. On the x-axis, we have n. The y-axis is the probability of us choosing a prime less than n. For n equals 100, the probability is 25%. For n equals 1000, the probability is 16.8%. Here are some examples of values. Now, is there a nice function that approximates this scatter plot? This is the function one over log n. As we consider larger and larger values of n on the x-axis, the graph of one over log n hugs the points more tightly. So it seems that the probability of choosing a prime less than n is approximately one divided by log n. Now, for those of you who are interested, there is a way to make this mathematically precise, and this is done in the so-called prime number theorem. The event of an integer being prime in some way behaves like a random event with a probability one over the logarithm of the integer you have in question. In this video, we're exploring a math concept at a fairly high level. But if you've ever wanted to go deeper and learn the details for yourself, it's really helpful to learn it in a class setting. I'm teaching a live online class about group theory. This is one of the most fundamental and beautiful areas of math. It's a subject that got me interested in abstract math in the very first place. The class will feature weekly live Zoom calls where I'll explain the content from that week, curated problem sets where you get to practice the content from each week, and finally, an online community where you get to discuss problems with and interact with other like-minded folks who like learning math. If that sounds exciting, there's a short form in the description. Just enter your name, email address, and location, and I'll send you the details once the class is open. Thanks, and let's get back to the video. Now, this theorem is very useful at telling us about primes, but it doesn't tell us about twin primes. Now, all of this changed in the year 1915, when Norwegian mathematician Viggo Brunn entered the scene. So what did he prove? Remember how we said earlier that the probability of choosing a prime between 1 and n is approximately 1 over log n? Let's adapt this for twin primes. Suppose I pick two numbers less than n, which are two apart. 
say k and k plus 2. What's the probability that both of these numbers are prime? Well, the probability that k is prime is around 1 over log n. The probability that k plus 2 is prime should be 1 over log n. The probability that they're both prime should be the product of these two things, i.e. 1 over log n squared. Of course, this is not at all a rigorous calculation. However, this is not exactly correct, because of course being a prime is not a random event. You could put this expectation into the question, is p and p plus 1 prime, and would get the same answer, which is of course wrong, because p and p plus 1 can't be, apart from 2 and 3, can't be prime at the same time. Now, this hand-wavy calculation is useful, because it tells us what we should expect the distribution of twin primes to be. Of course, proving this directly is going to be really, really hard, but Brun didn't shy away from it. He asked, okay, if we can't prove the whole thing, can we at least prove one inequality? And that's exactly what Brun did. He showed that there is an upper bound here. Okay, actually he showed a slightly weaker statement with an extra term, but this was subsequently removed with future refinements of his work. The proof is so cool that I want to show it to you in detail. As a warm up, let's first prove the following. As a reminder, here's what the prime number theorem says. We'll use a sieve to prove something weaker. This probability is at most 1 over log log n. Say you want to list all the primes less than, say, 30. Here's how to do that. First, cross out all the multiples of 2, except for 2 itself, because 2 is a prime. Then do the same thing for the next prime, 3. Cross out all the multiples of 3, except for 3 itself. Do the same thing for 5. If you do this for enough primes, you will eventually get a list of all the prime numbers less than 30. But we don't want to just list the primes less than 30, we want to count them. So let's count how many things we crossed out at each stage. We crossed out 14 multiples of 2, 9 multiples of 3, and 5 multiples of 5. Adding these up, we've crossed out 29 numbers, including 1 because 1 is not a prime. But this isn't quite right, because some numbers got counted twice. For example, we crossed out the number 6 twice, once when we crossed out the multiples of 2, and once when we crossed out the multiples of 3. We have to add back all the multiples of 2 and 3, because we crossed them out twice. Likewise, we add back all the multiples of 2 and 5, then we add back the multiples of 3 and 5. In total, we're adding back 10 numbers. Now we're almost done. We've still overcounted the numbers that are multiples of 3 primes. There's only one such number, 30. In all, We've removed 29 multiples of 1 prime, we've added 10 multiples of 2 primes, and we removed the number 30, which is a multiple of all 3 primes. After this, 10 numbers remain. Let's graph this. We crossed off 29 numbers, which are multiples of 1 prime. We added back 10 numbers, which are multiples of 2 primes. We subtracted 1 multiple of all 3 primes. The true number of primes less than 30 is 10. This process is called inclusion-exclusion. You first exclude the multiples of 1 prime, you include the multiples of 2 primes, you then exclude the multiples of 3 primes, and so on until you're done. I kick out the multiples of 2, and I kick out the multiples of 3, but then I have a problem, because all multiples of 6 I have kicked out twice. I need to re-add one time the multiples of 6. This process is called inclusion and exclusion. Let's use this method to prove this upper bound for the number of primes. Let's say that you want an estimate for the number of primes less than n. We'll start off with a list of primes to sieve by, say 2 and 3. Overall, this is approximately n minus the multiples of just one prime plus the multiples of both primes. Since we're carrying out this process at two steps, this gives us an overestimate for the number of primes. Now we have to estimate each of these terms. How do you count the number of multiples of 2 less than or equal to n? Approximately, it's n over 2. But it may not be exactly n over 2. There's a small error term, call it epsilon 2. If n is even, this error term is 0. But if n is odd, this error term is minus a half. Now the important thing I want you to keep in mind is that epsilon 2 is between minus 1 and 1. Likewise, let's count the multiples of 3 less than or equal to n. This is approximately n over 3. There's an error term, epsilon sub 3. Its exact value depends on what n is modulo 3. Just like before, the thing I want you to keep in mind is that epsilon 3 is between minus 1 and 1. We can deal with the multiples of 6 in the same way. It's n over 6 plus epsilon sub 6, where epsilon sub 6 is between minus 1 and 1. If we substitute these expressions into our formula, it looks like this. Now let's group all the n terms together 
and all the epsilon terms together. These n terms are the main terms. These epsilon terms are the error terms. But remember that the epsilon terms are between minus 1 and 1, and there are three of them. So we can replace the epsilons with a 3, at the cost of potentially making the right side a bit bigger. Note that 3 is 2 to the 2 minus 1. There are two primes, and that's where the exponent 2 comes from. So how do we deal with the main term? So here is the main term. First, let's factor out the n. Our goal is to simplify the term in brackets. First, try grouping the first two terms. I want you to look at the last two terms, minus a third plus a sixth. We can factor minus a third from the last two terms. Notice that the term 1 minus a half appears twice, so factor it out. So we can write our main term as follows. Let's substitute that into our formula. The reason we do this is that there's one term in the product corresponding to each sieving prime. So here we started with two primes, 2 and 3. Now suppose we start with k primes, p1 to pk. k has to be even so that you're overcounting the number of primes. Continuing the pattern, the main term would look like this. There's one term in the product corresponding to each sieving prime. There would be 2 to the k minus 1 error terms, epsilon sub i. Since they're between minus 1 and 1, their sum would be bounded by 2 to the k minus 1. That minus 1 is a bit awkward, so we'll get rid of it at the cost of making the right-hand side a bit bigger. This is the main term, and this is the error term. We need to choose k so that the main term is big and the error term is small. To control the main term, I'm going to introduce a result that we'll take as a black box. The mathematician Franz Mertens proved that this product is dominated by 1 over log k. The number of primes less than n is at most this product plus 2 to the k. So we can replace the product in our expression with 1 over log k. Well, the main term grows exponentially. So to cancel that out, let k equal the logarithm of n. If we do that, we get this. We can simplify the second term using some algebra. It becomes approximately n to the 0 0.301 dot dot dot. Now the error term is dominated by the much larger main term, so we could just drop the error term. In conclusion, we find that the number of primes less than n is dominated by n divided by log log n. Well, the probability of finding a prime less than n is the number of primes less than n divided by n. From our argument, the number of primes less than n is at most n over log log n. Dividing through by n, we see the probability is at most 1 over log log n. Now here's the true bound, 1 over log n, from the prime number theorem. And here's the bound that our sieve gives us. You'll notice that it's quite a bit worse than the prime number theorem, but it's still a highly non-obvious bound, and we proved it using entirely elementary techniques. But the real benefit of sieve techniques is not just that they can count primes, but they can count twin primes. This is exactly what Brun did. He introduced an extra parameter in the sieve and set it just right, and then he proved his theorem. Now, Brun's sieve was a huge breakthrough. It gave us an upper bound, showing that there aren't too many twin primes. But what we need is a lower bound for the twin prime conjecture, something that says that there are lots and lots of pairs of primes that are very close together. Now people started to think, okay, maybe we're being too ambitious. If we can't prove that twin primes appear infinitely often, can we at least prove that the primes don't drift too far apart? To understand this, we need to understand the concept of average gap between primes. Here's an analogy to understand this. Suppose you have a lot of people standing in a line, and you know that one-fifth of them have blue eyes. If the people with blue eyes are evenly spaced in the line, you'd expect that the average gap between people with blue eyes is 5. The same logic works for the primes. The probability of choosing a prime less than n is around 1 over log n. So if you assume that the primes are evenly spaced in the number line, the average gap between primes less than n is around log n. The twin prime conjecture says that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that are two apart. This is very hard, so let's try proving something easier. Let's try showing that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that are closer together than the average gap. Precisely, let p sub n denote the nth prime. Can we show that there are infinitely many pairs of primes such that the difference between them is less than log pn? In 1940, the famous mathematician Paul Erdős proved that this was true. For 40 years, the state of affairs didn't improve. But in 1986, Helmut Meyer put a one-fourth on the right side. Then in 2004, Daniel Goldston and Chem Yildirim 
showed that you can lower the constant to 0.085786. But in 2005, a trio of mathematicians, Goldston, Pince, and Yildirim, proved a result which shocked the mathematical community. They showed that you can make this constant as small as you want. If you take it to be 0.01, there are infinitely many primes which are closer together than 0.01 of the average gap, likewise with any number you choose. But 10 years later, Yitang Zhang made a stunning breakthrough. He brought the gap down to 70 million. Yitang Zhang showed that there are infinitely many primes p, such that at least one of the following 70 million integers is also a prime number. This was absolutely amazing. GPY showed that you could bring gaps between primes arbitrarily small compared to the average. But Yitang Zhang was able to bring the number down to a concrete number for the first time, 70 million. This was completely unprecedented. Then a bit later, James Maynard improved the bound. He was able to reduce 70 million to 600. Now that alone would be a breakthrough, but his techniques also showed something even deeper. It showed bounded gaps for clusters of k primes for any natural number k. For this and related results, Maynard was awarded the Field Medal in 2022. Later by the Polymath Project, this number was decreased to 246, where it currently stands. So after all this, why should you care about the twin prime conjecture? Well, Necessity is the mother of invention, and a problem should be judged based on how much new mathematics it is generated. In this case, the twin prime conjecture is related to so much exceptionally beautiful math. Brun's sieve, the work of Paul Erdős, Helmut Meyer, the GPY sieve, the breakthroughs of Yitang Zhang, Maynard, and Polymath Project. It's possible that none of this stuff would have happened if people were not inspired by the seemingly simple riddle about prime numbers. Now, we still don't know how to solve the conjecture, but we've never been closer. And that's something that I'm really excited for. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next video.